Hello everybody and welcome! Today, I'm excited to talk about my final first thoughts on the Hemlock Vale campaign. Uh, we finished it um, last night at the time of recording this video, which for perspective of YouTube time is May 16th. So on the 15th of May, we finished playing our blind run of the campaign. And um, uh, I'm ready to talk about it. I, I already did a video uh, recently where I did through the halfway point where we did day one, uh, night one, day two. Uh, we play. Uh, we played uh, the Lost Sister. We played the Twisted Hollow, and then we played the thing in the swamps, the thing in the depths, like the yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and we played three more scenarios. We played uh, the Long Night, Ridden in Stone, and the Fate of the Veil. Vale. So we finished the campaign. And I'm here to talk about my first thoughts on the entire Hemlock Vale campaign, now that I've seen it from front to, uh, front to end. Missing two scenarios. There are two scenarios we did not play on this run. Um, we are going to be doing our rerun right away, so I'm excited to dive into them and play those ones when the time comes. However, when I, uh, I'm not going to be talking about them in a video like this about my first perspective uh, and first thoughts on the blind play. Because the blind play's done! Um... And I'm going to talk about it spoiler-free and with some spoilers, um, but we're going to start with the spoiler-free section. Uh, in the first video, I was very high on the Feast of Hemlock Vale campaign. Um, I think um, the blind run, uh, I was saying that it was probably my favorite blind run since Dream Eaters. And uh, I was hopeful and optimistic that it was going to stick the landing. Uh, I liked what I saw. Uh, and do I still have those thoughts after playing and finishing the Hemlock Vale blind, pl blind play? And I'm going to say that yes, I do. I think that this has probably been um, overall, I think that this is now my second favorite blind play I've ever had for a campaign. Uh, Dream Eaters is close, depending on the time of day and when you ask me and when the hype subs like like goes away for a bit um it's really going to change depending on that but right now i think that this is my number two after carcosa carcosa was very special to me and it's going to be hard i think to ever top that feeling um just like kind of like just personal feelings and connection to the campaign that all that becomes that haster is my favorite old one it kind of just works that way um but the feast of hemlock Vale was a very very good experience and i had a ton of fun playing that campaign like it, it it was an incredible time i'm trying to think about okay i'm going to talk about the mechanics spoiler free we're going to talk about like the whole thing spoiler free for a bit and then i'm going to get into some specifics um first off i think the theme is incredible um the theme is you go to an island and there's like a crazy cult um and they're worshiping this tree in the center as you can see on the box art just like over here um <clears throat> and that like it's just kind of like things get crazier and crazier and the nights are worse than the days because bad stuff is happening at the nighttime. But there's still bad stuff in the daytime, but it is a lot worse at night. Um, so I think the theme is really good. I think the characterization is, as a whole, pretty strong. Um, we didn't get to interact with everybody, which is going to be my next point here about... Um, the next mechanic, which is the residence of the island. I actually went back... And I checked out my initial video where we first read the article. I read the comments because there was a lot of doom and gloom coming into this one due to the one-two hit of Edge of the Earth and Scarlet Keys. And while there are people that like those campaigns, and I'm not going to try to knock you for, you know, not liking them. Because, I mean, ultimately I do still enjoy Edge of the Earth, and I'm not too hot on Scarlet Keys. But the community as a whole isn't... If you just look at, like, the just general opinions that you can see in the community they're not that hot on those two on those two campaigns so the mood of the community was actually pretty harsh in that video um in in certain aspects in regards to the mechanic of befriending and having relationship levels with the villagers um and i will say that uh for me personally uh this was a lot more appealing than what we saw in Edge of the Earth um, in terms of like building a relationship with these NPCs. Um, I still feel like compared to Edge of the Earth, where in Edge of the Earth, I felt like um, a passenger for the story of these uh, 
these partners that you can work with. In Hemlock Vale, I very much feel like the driver. And I think that's the most important thing for why Hemlock Vale was such a success for me and such a return to form was because I felt like as the player, I was impacting the scenarios, I was impacting the story, and I was impacting the mechanics, which then told their own story, which I thought was like really cool and really impressive. And <clears throat> something that I think um, was kind of a little bit lacking in some of the previous, in some of the most recent campaigns. Um, interacting with the villagers is fun. The villagers, as I said, I think as a whole have pretty good uh, personalities to go with them. <clears throat> I'm excited to explore their stories and kind of see more um, with it. We followed a path for one character for this, well, two characters for this campaign, um, but I don't want to dive too much into them in the spoiler-free section. But it's fun to interact with them. There's some cool stuff that you can get when you interact with them. And there's a cool through line from scenario one all the way to scenario six that works with that character, <clears throat> which I think is, is really cool. Um, the next mechanic I want to talk about is the campaign structure. Again, going back to my previous video and comments that I saw online, there was a lot of worry about this um, campaign and its structure because we just came off the heels of Scarlet Keys. Scarlet Keys was a big swing from the designers where they went for an open world perspective of you can choose the path in which you take. And that's cool. It's cool. But it is very overwhelming. <laughs> it is, I think, structured a little bit. Uh, it, it, it's not as structured as good as it could have been. I think the initial map layout should have been... I, I talked about this in a in a Scarlet Keys one year later video, where I feel as if the map immediately, every point that you traveled from the first direction led to a scenario, it would be a lot better um, structured. Um, and uh, it was one of those things that um, it made people scared because Hemlock Vale had a similar sort of pitch. I remember from um, the, the designer um, Duke in the video, um, the Gen Con reveal video where it was like, you can choose your path and it, there's a lot of replayability because things change depending on the order in which you attempt the scenarios. So a lot of people were like, oh my God, it's another open world type thing. In my, uh, also I think in the Scarlet Keys video, when I talked about Hemlock Vale, I was hoping that the structure would be more akin to um, the Dunwich Legacy, where in the first scenario you, in the first scenario you choose one of the two to play. Another option that you consider this, if you've played the custom campaign Dark Matter, after you play scenario one and two, you choose the order for three, four, and five, and they change depending on how you do them. So I was hopeful and optimistic that Hemlock Vale would be somewhat similar. And I can say with excitement and happiness that yes, Hemlock Vale is, is not exactly that kind of structure. It is more open than that. But the Hemlock Vale structure is a lot more closed than it is open, while still being relatively open for you to choose the path in which you take and the scenarios that you want to play. I'm going to give some slight spoilers to the campaign structure here but it's not talking about specific things it's really just in how the choice works if you don't want to see this skip ahead for a little bit uh and then it'll it'll eventually it'll it'll dissipate so in scarlet keys you play the first scenario and then the map is given to you and you can do whatever you want in hemlock Vale, you play a prelude and then you choose one of i think five or six day scenarios to play so there is written in rock the Thing in the Depths, Lost Sister, and then the two we haven't played. So that you can choose between one of five scenarios that you want to play. Then, that's day one, done. You go to night one. And you can choose to either play the specific night one scenario, so it's like forced onto you. You always can play that one. Or, you can choose to ignore that one and then go play one of the other day scenarios that you did not play. But let's assume you just played the night scenario for the first one, nice and simple. It then goes to day two and you play another prelude and then you choose one of the four or three remaining day scenarios to play and you play that one. It's done. You're now down to three scenarios left, right? I, have to, I can't go like this. I have to go like that. You're down to one of the three scenarios left. You then go to night two, and you can choose to either play the specific night scenario, or again, at the cost of some tokens into the bag, you can, oh, 
maybe I shouldn't have said that. The cost of like a, a, an, an extra cost, which unfortunately now you know what it is. It's okay, I'm sorry. I apologize for that. Uh, you can play another one of the remaining nights, uh, day scenarios, which means if you played, uh, if you played uh, that one, you have three left to choose from. And one, two. No, you have two left to choose from. You have two left to choose from. Um, so, but let's just say once again you played the specific night two scenario. Then you go to a third prelude where you choose one of the th remaining three scenarios to play, leaving you with two scenarios left unplayed through the campaign, and then you go to a final scenario um, that closes the campaign. Um, so that means that assuming you don't do any of the night scenarios, you can play all five of the day scenarios. If you do play the two night scenarios, you're only playing three of the day scenarios. This allows you, so like again, what I mean by like the structure is completely closed while still being open, right? The choice is a lot simpler. You're just like, hey, I haven't played this one in day one. I want to try it out. It's a little bit more complex than, hey, I haven't played House Always Wins First. Uh, so let's play House Always Wins First today from Dunwich Legacy. Um, so it means that it's a lot easier and you can actually kind of curate the campaign that you want without having to track time and all that stuff. It's just a lot easier. But it also means that the path in which you follow can determine what in, uh, residents you interact with. So I think the campaign structure as a whole was very good. I did uh, say previously in my first video for this that I was, I'm hoping that the next one is just a traditional eight scenario campaign because I really want to see what the designers can do with an eight scenario campaign. I mean, actually, like, honestly, after the last scenario of this one, uh, I am actually very excited to see what the designers can do because uh, they're cooking. <laughs> it might not be everybody's cup of tea, but the final scenario goes freaking hard in this one. All right, what's the next mechanic? Day night. I, I talked about this previously in my first thoughts on the campaign. The day night mechanic's really cool. Um, there's, uh, depending on if you're playing at the day or the night, you get different things, and then cards change with some simple iconography that makes it nice and simple to kind of like see which one's which. Um, it's harder at night, easier during the day. Some scenarios um, that I talked about previously to turn this on its head, um, which is, is kind of cool. Uh, but I think overall the day-night is a nice simple mechanic, and honestly, I would not be upset if it's explored again. Especially, like, you know, we go into Arkham Woods, we get to play around in there, there's like, some stuff in that. I think that would be kind of a fun mechanic to explore. Um, <clears throat> do I have anything else to talk about the whole thing? There's really, like, no... Um, there's no mechanic like the Tekalilis or, like, Concealed... That's kind of just like an omnipresent thing throughout it. I think it's like mostly just the day night and then like the partners. There is this new thing called the code. Oh, the reading. Let's talk about the reading. Because I know a lot of people, once again, off the back of Scarlet Keys, were very concerned about that sort of thing. Um, there's reading in Hemlock Vale. I'm not going to pretend there isn't. But it's a lot shorter and it's in small bursts throughout the scenario during setup and, in, and, and uh, during interludes and resolutions. It is a lot lower than uh, Scarlet Keys. It's, I would say, I mean, Edge of the Earth has a bad rap because like a lot of it is in the intro. I think Scarlet Keys is uh, the biggest offender personally for like myself and the community general sentiment. Um, which is not going to say is law. I'm not going to say is law, but I'm just, once again, I'm speaking from just like the general perspectives that I've read online in like the the majority perspectives for this um and the and the the reading for this one is a lot less than that um it's done primarily through a new mechanic called the codex which i kind of hope they revisit because i think it's it's a good way of structuring it and what's important is that it's actually kind of fun right um travis was excited to read the stuff when um when it happened and, uh, you know, we were excited to see how things came together. And uh, to also echo um, my my colleagues, Travis and Bryn's perspectives, uh, we want to play the rerun right away, which is good news, right? We, we want to, like, our, our, our media, like, once, uh, I mean, for you in YouTube time, once the gameplay, like, once we wrap up our blind play this, um, I mean, like, we wrapped it up on two days ago, uh, we're going to be, our rerun is going to be starting this week. So we're like diving right back into Hemlock Vale because we had a good time with it. Um, <clears throat> the mechanics, 
uh, in the individual scenarios, this is another thing I've read online, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to address it, um, that they can be quite complex. And I agree. I do think that the Feast of Hemlock Vale is not a great beginner's campaign. Um, mostly because I do think that the individual scenarios themselves do bring a lot to the table in things, and like in their setup, and like how things are explained. Um, I think the board states in Feast of Hemlock Vale can particularly get quite overwhelming. Um, however... If you've been playing Arkham for a long time, I do think that Feast of Emlock Hale brings a lot of good stuff to the table. And while those things are complex at first glance and during setup, we found with the three of us that they were actually relatively simple once you actually put them into practice. There was um, definitely like a little bit of a shock when we were setting up certain things. But then when it all came together, we were like, ah, oh, wait, no, this is this is easy. <laughs> like, this is actually like relatively simple. And in some aspects, we're actually really worthwhile to play with. So I do think that uh, I'm not going to pretend that the complexity is low for this one. Because I think the individual complexity, at least in the scenarios we played, is on the higher end. So like Feast of Hemlock Vale for me probably gets, uh, we did a, a video, Travis and I, where we gave a green, red, or yellow light to each of the boxes. And I think Feast of Hemlock Vale would get a yellow light from me. It's a complex campaign, but I think it is a very worthwhile and fun adventure. And I think it's a great Arkham Horror campaign box that you can play. I personally love it. Right now, I think it is actually my second favorite campaign as a whole. Um, this is a, a lot of hype talking because I just finished it. But like... Edge of the Earth and Scarlet Keys, even Innsmouth, when I was done them, I was like, they were fine. They were good, but they're like in the lower end. I haven't had something breach the top three in a very long time. And Hemlock Vale, for me personally, has breached my top three. It is, it is my number two behind Carcosa. Um, I'm excited to play the other two scenarios. I'm excited to see how this whole thing works in... Um, in in replays, I want to see, like, if it's like Carcosa, where I can be like, hey, like, these small little aspects can really change how the uh, the scenarios are played. Um, I think that the campaign structure as a whole has more replayability than Carcosa for me, which is interesting. I mean, I'm curious to, I'm, I'm curious to chew on this campaign, basically. But I'm, I'm in love with it. I think it's fantastic. Uh, and I think we're going to dive into the spoilers. So if you are watching, and to avoid spoilers, this is the time for you to dip out. But thank you for watching. But why don't we talk a bit about spoilers? Okay. All right. Well, now that all of the people who don't want spoilers have left, why don't we talk about um, The Longest Night, which was the first scenario that we recorded yesterday. That's night two. Um, and I've heard, I knew before, uh, I, I had some, uh, <laughs> I had some communications uh, with some people in our Discord. I've had a, even a, <laughs> just I had the, a message from uh, Duke being like, how are you doing? <laughs> like, he was just like, uh, wants to know how, how like, you know, are uh, you doing okay? Because a long night is uh, a tough, overwhelming scenario in like all the right ways. Um, this one was a little bit scary when we were setting it up for a multitude of reasons. Number one, um, a big thing was that... Um, <laughs> uh, I've played a lot of custom campaigns where they use the mechanic of survive an onslaught of enemies um, as at like one location, right? Or like, like one map and enemies are coming. And I've never liked them. I've never enjoyed a scenario where it's all about surviving an enemy assault. It's just not my cup of tea, right? I guess the closest one we've had is Ice and Death Part 3. That, that, that shares some similarities to it. But I've never enjoyed a scenario where it's about holding down the fort um, while enemies are bearing down on you. It's just not a mechanical thing that I enjoy. With that said, this was the first time I actually dug it. The Longest Night, I think, was an absolute winner of a scenario. And I think that, like the Unspeakable Oath, for reasons that we didn't find out until we were reading the next, uh, we were reading like the resolution in the interlude, um, that this is going to have a lot of comparisons to the unspeakable oath for me, where every time I go to the scenario, I'm going to feel scared because it is unrelenting and it might have, uh, some investigator 
elimination involved in the whole thing. Um, so if you don't know this one, if for some reason you don't remember it or you you are just you don't care about spoilers and you want to just hear me talk, in this one you have um, you draw basically two Mythos cards a turn. Each investigator, each investigator is going to draw an enemy. And then each investigator is going to draw from the Mythos deck, which is not an enemy. There's no enemies in the Mythos deck. Which means it's great to be Hank Sampson. It's great to be Zoe Samaras because of their signature weaknesses. Um, so these enemies always spawn at the outer quadrants. And then they move in to attack some things in the middle. And one thing that I do enjoy is that you care um, enough to try to keep these people alive. And then you also have... Uh, you get rewarded for how good you do, which is the kind of metric that you really want to see in a game because it brings in more replayability, right? Like, oh, this time we got this much damage on them. Let's see if we can do better next time. And you get rewarded for it, right? Which I think is really cool. <clears throat> um, so that's a lot of enemies every turn, right? Like every turn an enemy shows up. An enemy shows up from all players. So in a three-player game, we were getting three enemies a turn. And... If we didn't kill those enemies, that means next turn we had six enemies. If we didn't kill those enemies, next turn we had nine. So it's like a lot of enemies on the board, um, which is very overwhelming. In addition, you start with a very big-ass enemy on the board, otherwise known as the Annihilation Bear, right? So, like, it's it's very scary from the get-go, and you're like, well, we're fucked. <laughs> like, it, this, is, this is bad news for us. Um, however, um, I think that the board, um, what's really good is that um, there is a mechanic that, once again, as I was saying previously, it's daunting at first, but then you like you just strip it down, and you're like, wait a minute, this is, this is simple, this is great. Where you can put down barriers, decoys, or traps, which are represented by resource, uh, horror, or damage tokens on locations or between locations. Barriers tr stop people from entering, they hit the barrier and then stop. Um, decoys, if they move in, they're exhausted. They're frozen, actually, they, they don't ready that round. Uh, and then they take a damage. And traps is they just take two damage. Um, and this is a very nice way, and there's a lot of control, and they're very easy to put down, to take advantage of what you need when you need it in the right time. Again, I will say this is, uh, I said this in the previous video, uh, there's some chances that we might have got some mechanics wrong, because these are dense mechanic scenarios. So they're, this come from a perspective of blind play where we might have mucked a rule up. And if that does happen, I there's nothing I can do about it now, right? We played it to the extent that we understood it and we might have messed some things up. But my perspective is coming from this individual play, which by the time that this, this video is live and that previous one went live, like the gameplay video went live, I, I could now be looking back and be like, wait a minute, we did that wrong. Um... Whoa, what, what, what was I saying? What was I saying? So yeah, like these things are moving in and um, you can you can interact with the decoys, barriers, and traps to take advantage of it. So you actually have a lot of control, which is, I think, really uh, the, the real separating line between me and those other ones that I played in custom campaigns. And while none of them are, I think, like, I don't think there's like a, like a bad scenario I played in a custom campaign like that. Um, they just like are not my cup of tea because I feel like they... They don't have that balance that this one had. I think that this one had like a right amount of aggressiveness with a right amount of control with a right amount of hopelessness and especially as everything closed in on your center location, it was just very overwhelming, which was really cool. Um, notably, if you don't want to play this one, you can just skip it. You can play another uh, day phase during uh, like a, a day scenario during the night just to be like, you know what? I don't think I'm going to mess with that. I don't think I'm following that. I'm, I'm not feeling the longest night tonight, which is good because it is a hard scenario. Uh, and it's a very, I, I can imagine like certain players won't enjoy it because it's very mean. It's a very mean scenario. Um, I love it though. I think, dark, uh, I think the longest night might be uh, a scenario that lasts for me from this campaign. It might really live. If I do have some sort of criticism for it, it's, it's pretty... It's pretty minor. It's actually kind of just a templating thing. And it's mostly just for ease of use for the individuals. Um, a lot of the enemies in that one have a line of text, which is like ignores barriers between locations, ignores decoys on locations, ignores traps on locations. And I wish instead of saying that, it, or it did say that, but it also had in the text box, like maybe on the side, it had a resource token symbol, a, a damage symbol, or a horror symbol, just so we could easily look at the card and know what it ignores. 
because uh, then you don't have to like read the card pick it up and read it and spend some time just being like oh yeah what does this motherfucker do or be like oh shit this guy actually does ignore this we have to like rewind a little bit if it's just if it was just on the card i think it would be a lot easier to um grok the board state in the moment and not have to worry so much about spending time reading the enemies when you pick up you can just look at it and be like this guy has a resource on him he just moves through the resource tokens right which makes i think actually the process less overwhelming in terms of the upkeep of that scenario because i do think the upkeep of that scenario is relatively high all right let's drink some water before we get to the next scenario okay Whew. we got ridden in rock next so this is the one where you get to ride around on the minecart like donkey kong <laughs> uh, this is a cool scenario i think this scenario is actually really fun um i like sliding puzzles this one's just a big sliding puzzle uh we mucked it up a little bit at first but luckily we were able to rewind it pretty simple um but again like once again it, it, it's you're gonna make mistakes especially on a blind play especially when the, the, the mechanics are a little bit um there's a lot to them when you just are starting out um, but overall, I think the whole thing is... Oh, there goes Russ. Bye, everyone wave to Russ. Bye, buddy. Yeah, good stretch. You're going to sit there now? Uh, when Especially when you just see all the mechanics on the table for the first time. However, because I, I was, admit, I'll admit, I was very intimidated by the minecart mechanics when Travis, when we were setting up the board. But then Travis explained it, and then I saw it, and I was like, oh, wait, this is actually like a... This is chill as hell. This is just like, this is just life. <laughs> this is just how it is. Like, that's just like, you know, we're gonna just do this. It's it's easy. Um, and uh, it was just like a fun time. It's a fun scenario. I actually don't have any knocks against it. We did get a little bit screwed by RNG um, in terms of the last location we moved into. It, it caused some things, but I don't think, it, it doesn't actually like change things too much. It would have been unfortunate if it was someone else, but luckily for us, it wasn't the case. Um, this scenario reminds me a lot of actually kind of like a fixed um, horror in high gear. And it's actually something now that I've seen. Um, I like the general structure that it has where um, it's actually similar to Light in the Fog, which makes sense. It's the same designer for uh, Light in the Fog and, and this one, I assume anyway, um, where it has like, here's your starting thing where it's just like, this is the setup move through a few locations grab some clues interact they're going to start picking up some mechanics to help you with the future thing and then it's like oh here it opens up this lower this new map that's going to like really go fucking wild um and uh it's it's just it's like just a nice i think it's a nice pace scenario i think the finish is really cool um yeah i, I honestly like don't really again we might have messed something up but i don't think so it's hard to say but I, like I said, I think it, it, it's very horror and high gear to me, but I think it's like a, it's a more reasonable horror and high gear. I think it, it, it works really well. Uh, on to the final scenario, which had, we, we, I mean, we always have some preludes in there, and I like how the preludes become scarier and scarier. When you arrive on day one, the preludes are actually like kind of chill and happy, and you're like, oh, I love being here. And day two, it's still like pretty okay. Then you get to day three and you're like, oh, fuck. <laughs> then you get to the evening one and you're like, oh, my God, what's happening? Um, then before the final scenario, you play um, another prelude type thing where um, it doesn't follow the same structure as the uh, preludes before. And I want to talk on this one because I do know that there was some, at least in our Discord channel, there were some people expressing some disdain for that. And I think generally that disdain is fair. Um, I think that it could have been structured better in terms of the rules at the beginning, where instead of saying this is how preludes work, this is the inst say instead, um, this is the general sentiment of preludes. Um, however, make sure to read the resolution of that prelude for instructions on how to go to the next scenario. Because with all other preludes before, you keep some cards in play, a card in play, you, you know, you get a, like, get resources and all that. Um but it's uh and then you don't upgrade your experience but in the final scenario you don't keep any cards at play you get to use your experience and you do a whole shuffle up and mulligan before the next one and i understand the frustration but at the same time like the each scenario each prelude's resolution does tell you what to do so like uh instead of rtfc it's rtfcg right read the fucking campaign guide that's kind of like the thoughts i personally have for it 
I understand the disdain, but I think it's kind of like that's a you're making a mountain out of a molehill for sure. I think um, because it could have been better structure, but I'm not gonna like forgive the the designers for it because I do think that ultimately, yeah, if it's said at the beginning of the preludes that like sometimes this may change. I mean, maybe it does. I didn't read it. Travis did. Um, but it doesn't really matter in the grand scheme much, and it's, it's like, I don't care. <laughs> right? Like, it doesn't really bother me too much. Um, but uh, this final prelude uh, is kind of neat. We might have uh, done the thing where we sided with the baddies, and then, like, everything ended, and then, like, the uh, the campaign was a guy was like, hey, do you maybe want to do that again and pretend you didn't do that? Which I thought was a really cool addition. Um, and I actually think it was kind of neat because I'm pretty sure, like, I don't know if we could change it. And I'm curious to see if you could, right? But, um, we were playing this whole time of following Mother Rachel, I think that's her name, her plot line. And we were like, maybe we can convince her otherwise, right? So like, that's why we're doing it. We're like befriending her. We're going, we're going for the ride. And then we do it and it's like, ah, oh, fuck, no, we can't. It's like, it's cooked no matter what. Um, so, uh. I thought that was really cool and kind of, I think, like, even kind of, like, maybe potentially a meta commentary. It's like, you can't you can't convince a crazy otherwise. I don't know. Um, but I thought that was, like, really neat. And then you actually play it for real. And you go into the final scenario. And as I said earlier in this video, the designers went for it. And it's a pretty epic-feeling final scenario. It's, um, I actually can't think... Let's look at all the final scenarios. Lost in time and space. Like, I, I'm, talking, I'm talking about in terms of epicness. Because this scenario feels actually, like, surprisingly epic in its scope. Because, uh, like, Lost in time and space, I think, is cool. I think it's a good scenario. I think it's a great scenario, but doesn't necessarily feel epic. Dim Carcosa, kind of epic, but not really. Kind of thematic. F Shattered Aeons, who cares? But Before the Black Throne, I think, is... I'm not going to say epic for its scope because it is very, like, overwhelming and oppressive, which I think is the opposite of epic. Um, but I think I think Black Before the Black Throne, you could argue, is epic. Uh, the Dream Eaters finales are... I think they're cool, but I don't think they're epic. And when I mean, like, in terms of epic, I mean, like, the way that this story is told and, like, how, like, so there's, like, there's, like, three freaking story beats hidden inside of this thing that are just like incredible i think it's a great final scenario uh my beef with it my only beef with it is that i feel like it's a bit long our blind play was two hours and 45 minutes including preludes i'm curious to see what the length will be once we bring it down right like once we've played it a few times um because like to me a perfect arkham scenario is like 90 minutes long like that's like the longest i want to be playing a scenario of arkham um for three people um, but <laughs> this scenario, uh, like, kind of just, like, changes everything you expect from Arkham, which is really neat, right? Um, you get a new investigator card for the first bit of the scenario. The Mythos deck is different. The Mythos deck doesn't work the same. Your player cards are in the Mythos deck. Your investigator card is in the fucking Mythos deck. Like, this is crazy stuff! It's like mechanical exploration that actually also feels surprisingly elegant to play with. That's the thing, right? Like, this goes back to what I said earlier in the video where when everything was getting set up, I was like, oh my god, this is going to be freaking overwhelming. But then you put it into practice and you're like, wait a minute, this actually plays really nicely. I'm going to drink some water, sorry. This actually plays pretty nicely. And I'm not sure if this was on purpose <clears throat> or if this is just um, my interpretation of this, but there's a lot of, um, in terms of the allies, there's a lot of like conflict with identity and like self and all that kind of stuff. And I think that carries over into the final scenario where you yourself as an investigator lose your sense of identity. And then the euphoric feeling when you find yourself and you get your investigator card back and you are gifted like the, the biggest gift you can ever fathom. You're like, wait a minute. <laughs> this is incredible. Like this, the, the way that that 
tells a story for you as a player when you get it is just like holy hell that's like kind of awesome that the designers were able to do that they were able to get that feeling across to the players um when travis was able to get his kohaku back and i was like oh by the way travis you heal all your damage and horror and it's just like it's crazy you're just like what the hell you know like this is i feel like a new me because you found yourself again right like it's literally like the idea of like finding yourself you get your memories back you get yourself back you don't lose yourself to the madness that exists in the center of hemlock vale that's causing all this chaos in the middle of thing you have beat that and then you eventually crawl out and you have to decide what to do with hemlock vale and i believe there's four different paths that you can take um and it really just kind of like uh, we, we we did one of the four obviously because you can only do one of the four for each one i'm curious to see how the other ones like play once the time comes to it i think that's going to be fun to see the differences between them um so i i think that's really neat so like the first part of the scenario is going to play like the same um and then the second part is going to be different on what you do uh we were talking about it afterwards where i Due to the length, I wish that these were split into two scenarios, like how I wish Scarlet Keys was split into two scenarios. But Travis did bring up a good point that at least these feel connected, right? Like, this feels connected more than the Scarlet Keys. Like, the Scarlet Keys one actually kind of feels like two scenarios. There's actually a through line for this one that feels like it. However, for my own personal taste, I prefer shorter scenarios that you can have a bit more mechanical control over, and we're splitting it into two. Um, but that's just that's just me. What do I know? Um, last few thoughts. I think the encounter deck is incredible in this whole campaign. I think it's a pretty harsh encounter deck too, which is really fun. Um, they have a, if you remember in Dunwich, there's a card called Beyond the Veil that, uh, if your deck runs out of cards, you take 10 damage. There's a very similar sort of effect in the Feast of Hemlock Veil, which was, uh, refreshing. Um, and also I think that the campaign does a really good job of, forcing that card to be a problem it's a, it's a really cool um type of thing it also really like hoses certain investigators which is kind of fun i personally like that kind of thing there's so many investigators in this game that we can't get up in arms if one investigator is bad at a campaign i mean like really like we can't that that can't be an issue like come on <laughs> there's so many investigators who cares it's like how luke robinson can break everything sometimes like some other investigator is going to get broken that just happens and like that's it's the design space of exploring it like some because so many different investigators can react with so many different mechanics in this game there are going to be some investigators that are just absolutely hosed by something and that's good that's good like it's it's good that that happens so we can't let that be too much of an issue um i think that's all i can at least remember right now um from this i've been talking for like 38 minutes now um, and I'm, I'm sure there's something that as soon as I'm done recording, I'm going to be like, oh, right. Yeah, I wanted to talk about that. But overall, Feast of Hemlock Vale was an absolute incredible campaign. I loved it. I loved it. Like I said at the start of this video, it's in my top two. Now it's, it's going to go Carcosa and then Feast of Hemlock Vale. I'm going to see what time does for that. See how it settles for that. But I never actually hated a, a scenario. I actually also... None of the scenarios, I think, were mid to me. Like, I think, like, the closest one, I think the Twisted Hollow, uh, the first night campaign, was, like, the most scenario that I was like, this is fine. I, like, this is good. If I had to point at one, like, this is the one that I have, like, the least memories about. But I think everything else that I've played, like, the of the scenarios that we played, the six scenarios we played for this one, were all enjoyable campaign uh, scenarios to me, and I'm excited to try out the other two to see what they... Uh, add to the game and then i'm also very excited to pick and choose which scenarios i play on future replays i'm like oh i haven't played uh written written in stone for a little bit or written in the rock whatever it is so i'm excited to dive into that one again um but yeah i think that the designers should be very proud of this campaign um and this is why i said it i'm not gonna pat my own back i'm gonna pat my own back a little bit i was actually very excited about the um shift in the lead designers not because um you know that uh not because i was just like mostly just because like the the fact that like 10 years is a long time or however long uh, mj was working on the game that's a long time to be making a lot of design decisions and um having a new fresh perspective brings in new things right so i'm, I'm kind of even hoping that even though there is currently a lead designer for arkham um it kind of like 
in the back end, we see some things where like some of the other designers also are like, hey, I'm actually going to be leaning this one. Or like in Innsmouth when, um, for Light in the Fog, right? Like have like, like different scenarios for it. I think it, different perspectives can do a lot for game design. And it's the reason why Magic the Gathering has shifting lead designers for sets because new perspectives bring a lot of power and potential uh, and do new exciting things like the Abyss deck, which was a really cool mechanic. It was really cool. It was like nothing we've ever seen in Arkham before. Um, oh yeah, and I guess also the, the cool thing about the last one is staring at the thing for 15 seconds drives you insane. I thought that was pretty clever and meta. We also made some good jokes about it. I mean, I, I think the big thing for why Hemlock Vale was also just like really fun is because we had a lot of fun playing it because it was just good, right? It's just good. We were able to joke. We were able to laugh. We were able to just like enjoy what was happening because it was just paced so well and we were able to just really immerse ourselves in it and enjoy the story that was being told through the scenarios and our actions and i think that's why feast of hemlock Vale is a win and again i think the designer should be very proud all right thanks for watching everybody i hope you enjoyed this episode um Hemlock Veil, vale, baby. It's a great one. Uh, we also actually might do scenario reviews for this one. We haven't done those in forever. We don't know what we're going to do. We're just enjoying life. Um, but I hope you enjoyed this, and I hope you too enjoyed Feast of Hemlock Veil. Vale. Uh, in the meantime, have a good one, and as always, a GG's.